Perfect. Great. Thanks. All right, everybody. Let's go to uh, John, <clears throat> John chapter eight again. This to start us out. Uh, John eight, and uh, this is where we've been the last last few weeks. <clears throat> and <clears throat> let's pick up. Uh, let's pick up <clears throat> the reading at uh, verse thirty-one. Just grab a couple verses here. Actually, we're just honing in on verse uh, thirty-two, a fam familiar verse, but then fleshing it out, uh, pun intended, fleshing it out uh, with the Apostle Paul. And then we're going to launch into uh, Colossians 3, a little bit where we left off. So we were in Romans chapter 12, uh, 1 and 2, a little bit last week, jumping into uh, Colossians 3 with a little uh, overlay from Romans chapter 6. And uh, then we'll just see wherever we go from there, uh, here, there, and all over the place. Eventually, we're going to swing back around to, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, a little bit of Jesus in, uh, in the Gospel of John before we're done, uh, working through this, this whole idea of um, how, to <clears throat> how to train our, our minds, you know, tuning into how uh, the Spirit works and uh, in, in our lives through the new birth and our passive response to that, uh, getting a hold of that. So it says, then Jesus, this is uh, John chapter 8, 31 and 32, uh, says, then Jesus said to those Judeans who had believed him, if you continue, this is New English translation, just in case it reads differently from yours, if you continue to follow my teaching, this is this verb uh, meno uh, in the Greek, which he would use elsewhere um, in, for example, John chapter 15, uh, abide in me and I in you, meno. This is the idea of abiding or remaining or continuing. So here translated, if you continue to follow my teaching, lagos here, uh, lagos, word, word or reason. Um, <clears throat> you know, rhema is also another uh, Greek term for this, for the spoken word. Here the reference is to uh, teaching, so this, this, this teaching, but also that which is spoken or teaching. So you, you continue in this, you continue in my teaching, you, you, you remain in it, you follow it, my teaching, it's a fair translation. You are really my disciples, or one translation then says, you are my disciples indeed, and and you will know so this you'll know by experience you'll experience the truth and then we have found and seen john 14 6 jesus says ego i me in the greek you know i i am emphatically and then three things i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father uh, except by me he says and then jesus says and later on in that same passage john chapter 14 and verse 17, he's going to send the spirit of truth. So it's interesting the relationship between Jesus and the one he will send. Uh, not another heteros, not another of a different kind, but another alas, another of the same rank and found another of the same kind. Jesus says, I'm coming. I'm coming, though not in corporeal form, not in physical form like you see me now, but in a non-corporeal form, spirit as the uh, third person of the Godhead, I will come and be with you. So uh, again, let's just back up. Let's just repeat 32, Jesus's words, and you will know, you'll experience what? The truth, and the truth will what? Will liberate you, will set you free. Now he's not talking about <clears throat> mere cognition of something or mere rational uh, understanding of something as though, and I'm sure for us, you know, if we're reading some very interesting text or information, that can be enlightening to us. Wow, we say that. I didn't know that. That's, hmm, that's good. Really good. This is more than that. This is deeper than that. And that's what we have been uh, pursuing for some time. So <clears throat> the mind's renewal, then, we've been talking about. The mind's renewal from... Uh, you know, Paul in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, first, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice or present your bodies a sacrifice. And then what kind of sacrifice? Living, holy, acceptable, you know, sacrifice. And then uh, don't be, stop being conformed uh, to this world, but what? 
be transformed. How? By the renewing of your minds. Why? That you might uh, test and approve. What is that? What? Good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Or what is the will of God? The good, acceptable, and perfect. You know, this kind of thing in Romans 12, 1 and 2. So we find that the mind's renewal is, is preeminent. Uh, <clears throat> takes precedent over all things for us in terms of our sanctification, our becoming Christ-like in this process. <clears throat> so uh, it's passive then, uh, be transformed, we found from Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it involves not acting but being uh, acted uh, being acted upon. And from Romans 12, 2, this is just a little bit of short review. This is this verb in the Greek that we would get our English, I'm not saying directly, we would get etymologically, you know, this uh, term in English from, but this idea of metamorphosis, you know, that word we recognize, uh, uh, metamorphosis, to be transfigured, uh, something like that, or we could just say to be transformed from one thing to the next, keep on allowing ourselves to be transformed, Paul was saying something like that, um, but honing in on that, uh, hey, hey, you know, make sure you're allowing your minds to be engaged in this process of being renewed. Got to have those minds being renewed all the time. So the path of transformation is by continually seeing, uh, being aware of this process uh, of being renewed. Uh, now, I love to, you know, pull this apart that then there's my physical brain, there's a mind that's associated with my physical brain, that's associated with my body, but then there's me that has to have some relationship to my mind that's associated with my brain, that's associated with my physical body. I think like this, you know, because these are important things. The Apostle Paul thinks like this and pulls this stuff apart, uh, and we have to be aware of, of such things like this and be that pedantic about it. Um, so obedience to the command would require the believer to open themselves to the influence of a renewing agent. You know, who's this renewing agent? So if somebody tells me to do something, I want to know by what power, or by what agency. Is that me? Is that on me? Is it on you? Is it on somebody else? Um, how is this going to happen? If I don't know and by what resources, guess what? It doesn't happen. It's all aspirational. It's all in a dream state somewhere. Or if it's someone else that I delegate it to and they're questioning by what means or by, guess what? You come back a week later, two weeks later, did it happen? No, no, it didn't happen. Why? Because we didn't know by what means. I, where, where were the resources? You know, where, where was the follow through, right? Things happen because we understand, number one, who's in charge, who's going to do it, by what resources and what time frame, and then, wow, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And stuff actually gets done. It's amazing. Um, that's how Paul lays it out for us, quite nicely and quite beautifully. And he tells us the renewing agent, and that's the Holy Spirit. It sounds all technical, doesn't it? But he tells us quite clearly, quite succinctly and uncomplicated, he says, listen, it's the Holy Spirit. If only we could wrap our minds around that. No pun intended, but yeah, I guess it is. Um, it's the Holy Spirit who influences, who, whose influences, sorry, must be permitted access, and we must allow this or can prevent this. I mean, that's us. That's us. The, the Christian life is an, is an on autopilot. So uh, we can arouse, uh, uh, that is the Holy Spirit, uh, will arouse, will amplify, will accentuate these higher affections relating to our awareness of or appreciation for God and the things of God, our salvation, and all things pertaining thereunto. So let's jump over to, I, I just said a mouthful there, you know, really a mouthful worth hitting the pause button and reversing and going back and pulling that apart a little bit. Um, but... Colossians, as I'm leafing over to Colossians um, chapter 3, and then uh, I should have kept a little bit of a place in Romans chapter 6, which I've got there. Good. Colossians, Colossians 3 and Romans 6. 
Not that we're going to go a lot into Romans 6, but I just wanted to say that this is a bit of a mirror that Paul is, is doing, which we would expect, right? If this is the same author uh, and he's writing to different congregations, he may use, um, uh, by analogy, different ways of expressing himself, but saying virtually the same things, right? So uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and then uh, Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4, uh, saying similar things, but in Romans 6, 1 through 4, he uses the, uh, uh, the rite, R-I-T-E, rite of water baptism, uh, this motif to say virtually what he says here in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. So let me, I'll just read 6, 1 through 4, you see what you think. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Uh, Meganoito, he says in the, in the Greek, or, or say it isn't so, you know. <laughs> Are you kidding? Paul says, no, in the most absolute sense, or my translation here says, absolutely not, with an exclamation point. How can we who died to sin uh, live in it? Hence, what he'll get to eventually in his longer argument in Romans chapter 8, when he uh, contrasts in the flesh within the spirit, which we've went into in some detail. Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Now, it is this death part that he's going to make a meal of in uh, Colossians chapter 3 a little bit, but he also uh, does here and he does elsewhere. This is a, a, another bit of a motif. You know, get used to that word. You should. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you have better get, you know something about his motifs that he uses. And there are many of them. Um, and so he crafts his understanding, his conceptual understanding of a lot of the Christian life around these motifs to make it easier for us. And this is one of them here. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too uh, we may live a new life or, or walk in, in newness of life. Now we go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where he says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Now, here's your higher affections. Here's the, um, here's the appeal towards the higher affections. That is, the lower affections would be, if I am focused on the things of this world, just contemplating life in this world, and all things pertaining thereunto, or if I am focused on the higher affections, which simply mean my life with God, while living in this world, am I deeply concerned with what concerns God or my redemptive purpose for why I, as a child of God, am living in this world? You know, Philippians uh, 2, 12 and 13, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling for it's God who's at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So why is God working in me? And to what end? Why am I still here? Why, why am I not just a newborn child of God? And at that moment, I am just taken immediately into the presence of God. So there's a reason why I'm here, to work out God's redemptive plan, you know, at this time, at this place, in this nation, in this neighborhood. Um, what, what am I to do? So on and so forth. So, but he says, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, keep thinking, here's the mind, here's the mind, now watch this, because these are the high, high, higher affections, here's the mind associated, the renewed mind, what's the renewed mind doing? Keep thinking on things where above, not things where on the earth, right? So here's the difference between your lower affections and your higher affections. Not necessarily that the lower affections are horrible, 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 but he's saying on balance, on balance, channel one or channel two, where should you be spending your time? 
And he says, for you have died and your life, and he gives the four, is causal. There's a causal relationship between what he's appealing for thus far. And then he's saying, because, or for, you have died. You have died. Not you keep on dying, but you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is what has happened to you. A radical change has taken place. And when Christ, and by the way, parenthetically he says, and by the way, who is your life? Right? So if you go back just a little bit, uh, where he says, keep, th keep seeking the things which are above where Christ is. And then he comes back and says, who is your life? You see how Paul reasons here appears. So here's your, you know, almost like that Mount of Trans, not Mount of Transfiguration, but Mount of Ascension in Acts chapter one, where this angelic figure says, you know, why, why, why are you standing there gazing? Gaze, what are you guys looking at? You know, why, why are you staring up in there? Yeah. Well, I'm sure we all would, you know, never seen anything like that before until that cloud envelops him, you know. It's like, get on with it. Get on with it. Get on with the mission. Let's go. It's time. Let's get on, get on with it. Get on with it. Let's go. Get on with it. Right? But here's the idea that, look, and, look this is the mooring place of your heart. You know, this, this is where your, your life is there. Your heart is there then you too will be, this is the expectation. This is the expectation, you know, where he would say elsewhere in Philippians, ha curios agus, you know, the, um, the Lord has, has drawn near, you know, the parousia, the second coming, you know, he's, he's coming, all this Greek stuff, right? He's, he's coming near, he's, he has drawn near, he's, he's ever at your door, you know, this, even so come Maranatha, you know, even so come Lord Jesus. He's right there at the door. Um, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you too will be revealed uh, in glory with him. So we, we, get, we get this far in the opening four verses, and then we have to say, okay, so what's, what, what is with this about deferring to the Spirit and, and so on? And so um, here's a new spiritual reality um, that, that's present in the form of radical transformation is what Paul is saying. Specifically, the believer is now in the spirit. We found this in Romans chapter 8, of course, which is to say, uh, and then in Romans chapter 8, language, under the dominion. This is what in the spirit means versus in the flesh. In the flesh, under the dominion of the flesh ex exclusively. But now uh, we're in the flesh in the terms of we're in this world living in this, in this body, but now under the influence of the spirit, though living in the flesh, in this world kind of thing, so Paul was describing it. And then I say at least potentially, if not actually, that is under the dominion and influence of the spirit. And you say, well, why potentially and not actually? So whether or not the spirit is permitted to exercise the fullness of his influence upon our lives, is a matter of our passive abandonment of our life. So this is Paul's echoing Jesus's words in Matthew 16, 24. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now, something had to die. This is Romans chapter 6. This is somewhat what Paul is saying here in Colossians 3. Something had to die on our part in order for the Spirit to initiate our new life in, in Christ. So this occurred at the moment um, that we placed our faith in the Lord Jesus. For example, just a, a reading of 5, 1, and 2 of Romans. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. So this, this, occurs, this occurs at this particular moment when we place our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul says that we, we have died and that this death is decisive and final.
I mean, what does he say? Um, he says, yeah, keep thinking about this. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So he says, we have died and that this death is decisive and final. He uses the aorist tense to describe this. And then he uses the perfect tense to describe have been hidden. This is, this is a very interesting way that he describes it. So here you go. Here's a, to describe something that is uh, decisive, historical, and factual. Here's your aorist tense. But then something that, des that describes a completed event in the past, but the effects continue on into the present. Um, you, your life now that... You, that this death occurred, but now your life, your ensuing life, this new life is hidden with Christ in God. He's trying to say, listen, you are as safe as safe can be. Really, you are hidden with Christ in God. You have been, have been. Um, this is something God has done, this work. You didn't hide yourself in him. This has been done on, on your behalf. So this is an actual, actual spiritual condition of the believer. So what's potential then, if I say it's potential and not actual? This is the potentiality of our ongoing transformation. That is to say, um, what he's referring to in verse 5 then. Because there's the actual death that occurred. But then what does he talk about in verse 5? So put to death. Well, what does he mean? If a death occurred, now what's he talking about? So put to death. What is that all about? Now it's an appeal then to align the body's actions with the mind in such a way that the spirit is given preeminence or control. This is what he's talking about in Romans 12 too. You have to, con even though the motifs are different, you have to connect the dots, but the motifs are fairly simple. I, th I think they're similar. You know, when you say, I beseech you, therefore, my, my brothers and brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present or place beside the altar your bodies as a sacrifice. You do that. Uh, put, them, put them by the altar as a sac Hand them over to the priest as a sacrifice to be put to death so that you don't allow yourself to be conformed or pressed into the mold of this world, but instead allow your mind. So all this, all this happens, uh, the transactional part of this involves the mind. The mind is somehow involved in this whole process, but someone controls the mind and that's, and that's you. So the brain tells the body what to do, but what controls the brain? And so Paul is saying it's, it's the mind. But an even more basic question is, what controls the mind? Who decides to present the body as a sacrifice? And who, who tells the mind not to be molded into conformity with, with the world, but to permit the spirit to shape it into the form of its true spiritual identity in Christ, as we see in Romans 12 too. This is the I... For example, in Galatians 2.20, when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live. Now, you read the entirety of the book of Galatians, and this is the one place where you see the first person, the Apostle Paul, speak in the first person, and this, this just um, pops out in, in, in bold, uh, pulsating um, uh, lettering. I, I should say, I guess, uh, it's animated lettering jumps off the page to me because all of a sudden uh, we see Paul breaking through uh, and, and saying, it's almost like we have this um, ep, ep, exegetical little disclosure from the author. That you, you, can you imagine you're reading a novel and you're, you're going along in this novel and suddenly the author just jumps in and for a paragraph and says, hey, by the way, you know, and you go, oh, that was a little different. You know, you know, like here you're reading this novel and then suddenly the author jumps in and says something to you. 
You ever uh, see this in some of these movies are like this, right? And you're going along watching this movie and then suddenly the actor just turns to the camera and comes out of character and says something to you. You know, thought, well, that was weird. That was a little different. Can't think of one example right off the top. But this is Paul. And this is us. You know, this is the I. This is the I. This is the person. Um, and it, it is Paul self-identifying this, this vestige of his nature that's been renewed. This has been renewed in Christ, but... But, but now must be yielded over daily to the transformative power of the Spirit of God. This is this, is this what we call, I don't know, the cruciform life. You know, this is the, the, the alignment of, of one's life with the cross. This is 1624 again of Matthew. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It's, it's 1624 living. The eye must yield the mindset over to the spirit who takes over the body and orients our experiences, whether lower in the flesh to the world, to the world, over um, or higher in the spirit to God, both channels. Listen, um, it isn't saying that, oh, oh, you're you're thinking about the world. So the spirit's got to jump in there and get you to think about heavenly things. It's not it's not that at all. It's simply saying that whatever your interactions are in the world, you want the spirit to dominate that. You want the spirit to dominate your conversations with people, whether it's the workplace, whether it's whatever you're doing in the world, however your, your, your thought life is and your attitude is and your conduct and your character and life in this world. You have to live in this world. You have to be productive in this world. You have to have life in this world, but you also want uh, the Spirit of God stimulating those higher affections and deepening and giving you those contours and enriching, uh, enriching your, your life with God. Um, so uh, we can consider what Paul says uh, a little bit here in Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. He speaks about the believer's not just mind as he did in uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, where he just uses the word noose or renewing of the mind or your mental faculties, just generally, general terms. But here the believer's mindset or phroneo. Phroneo is a verb that ties in two things. One, it ties in your personal resolve. Now you can have all the personal resolve you want, but if it's never actionable and you never do anything, guess Guess how much applause you get for all your personal resolve? Zip, right? There's no congratulations for good intentions, right? So where are the results? <laughs> where are the results? Froneo takes into account personal resolve with the attending action. So we usually use words like, you know, um, you know, something that's actionable or intention or something. So it's somebody's mindset. It's a little bit stronger. Doesn't always achieve the results, but see if, see if you follow this. Um, is it easier? So if you, if you use a, if, if I was to use the expression, like change somebody's mind, I'm going to change your mind about something. But if I say somebody really has a strong mindset, that changes the conversation a little bit, right? Because when you think of somebody who has a really entrenched mindset, you think, oh, that person's really convinced. Now, I'm not saying that the evidence that convinces them is particularly good. I mean, it could be just, maybe they just had a traumatic experience that has convinced them, and that's awful difficult to reverse, you know. Um, but still, mindset, right? Um, now, our, our mindset, um, our mindset, where it says keep thinking of things above, not on things uh, on earth, our mindset has changed since the new birth and the arrival of the Spirit of God. Now, when you think, think about our mindset and what's been introduced, what has changed, significantly changed, um, since the new birth, since the arrival of the Spirit of God, we have now been awakened 
to spiritual realities and possess the capacity for fresh encounters with God. I throw the word capacity. doesn't mean we've exploited that capacity to its fullest extent. Nonetheless, it's there. But the mindset has, has changed. We might ask, um, what could reverse that? What could unconvince you that you're a child of God? Right? When you think of how strong that mindset is. I mean, I've, I, I, I watch hundreds of, of debates, you know, be, in terms of uh, worldview debates and things like this. And one of, commonly how many debates end, uh, especially between Christians and atheists, is uh, they will ask each other, you know, oh, oh, what evidence could, could convince you that you're wrong? Or what evidence could, could, what would be sufficient evidence to convince you that a God exists or that, that you could be wrong that God exists. You might ask the theist or the theist asks the, the atheist what evidence could, would be sufficient and so on and so on, right? And so um, the, the idea, the idea of that mindset being, being so, so, so strong. And I know that there are, there are examples of, of theists now that are out on uh, stumping, uh, ex-theists, you know, out there stumping as atheists and things like that. I, I get that. I know... I know uh, uh, a, a number of them that do so quite quite publicly, and uh, we could question, uh, you know, the the, found, the original foundation of whatever their faith was at, at one point. Um, nonetheless, that that mindset has changed, and this is this is what the Apostle Paul is saying here, and he's using this as a, as a ground for um, tapping into those spiritual realities and the renewing of the mind. Uh, by virtue of the Holy Spirit. Now, the idea of capacity for these fresh encounters with God, um, that has to do with, with um, our desire to cultivate these higher affections through the Spirit of God and how much of our mind is employed and otherwise committed to um, our, our, our availability to the Spirit of God and, and so on. And we should really uh, consider that. Honestly, consider that, which we probably don't. Um, honestly, I, I, I don't think we do. Uh, how how self-reflective are we to think this is my mind, I'm thinking, but how many of my thoughts and what I'm reflecting on, what I spend so much of my time and energy considering and thinking and it is energy. I mean, truly, it will sap your strength. How much of your energy, your physical energy is lost on your thought life and how much you're, you're dwelling on and how much of that um, is attributed to the Spirit of God being yielded control of that space, those mental faculties, and what he longs to give, and we haven't really gotten to that yet, the markers, the markers of what the Spirit of God brings when he exercises control of those mental faculties and uh, whatever we experience when we exercise complete control. And the idea does come down to control, control. So pa Paul's argument uh, is this, since we are now alive toward God and conscious of his presence in our lives, this is Colossians chapter 3, therefore if you have been raised with Christ, we are in other words alive toward God, we're conscious of his presence in our lives, our, our conscious awareness, our mental apprehension should guide us to where Christ is sitting literally, and we should do so by actively seeking. This is a present imperative, present active imperative. If someone with the authority of the Apostle Paul walked up to you, looked you in the eye, and on the basis of the authority of God's word said, <laughs> keep on seeking. I mean, what if, what if he says this? Keep thinking about things above. I'm telling you, verse 2 is 
a command. And it is, a, it is the worst conceivable command depending on the types of commands you want to hear from someone in authority over your life. Because he's telling you, keep on doing it. Put another way, never stop doing this. Now, uh, there are certain things that if we're told to, to continue doing so in perpetuity would probably cause us a lot of stress. Uh, if someone said, there's a treadmill right there, I'm going to set it on a certain number and you're not going to get off of it ever. Now you might start to panic a little bit. Said, uh, I'm not sure I want to try that. Okay. So there are certain things that if we said, you are going to do this in perpetuity, continuously, uh, without break, you're just going to keep on doing it. So, well, could I just try that out maybe uh, to five minutes for this or a little bit like this or certain things? There are these commands all over the place. You know, if it, if it says, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on, you know, Jesus in 7, 7 of Matthew. And there's a, but here's one here. Keep, 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 keep. This is the Apostle Paul. So he's saying, he, he is, he is, he's saying this, keep seeking such, such things. Why? And he's saying, why should this be so difficult? And he's making the argument because Christ is seated there. Christ is seated. Why should it be so hard to keep seeking those things which are above? Why? I'll make it easy for you. The one that you love more than anyone is seated there. The one that deserves your supreme attention and affection and devotion is seated there. Ah, and in case you forgot, when Christ, who is what? Your life, the one who you owe your life to, is seated there. So just keep, keep seeking him. And the other thing about this, this seeking is... Um, Where else are you going to go with all your cares and troubles? And I mean, let's just a little thought experiment coming into chapter three. I wonder on this plane of existence in this veil of tears, could you have any problems whatsoever? Well, where are you going to go? How about when the outlook looks bad, try the up look you know try come on here's one so you know this is paul making this appeal but but paul says oh we died and as a result our lives have been you know hidden they've been hidden with christ and god so here, here's this bit of insight this should resonate with our experience because he says directly christ is our life well, what do you suppose he means by that so here's this sense that our lives are hidden with him. It would make perfect sense to keep seeking because there's not separate things. There's not a separation, but a union. Isn't this the gist of John chapter 15 and the abiding? There's a sense, but there's a union. So this should be the natural outworking of our spirit-rich, spirit filled existence that we would keep seeking because we are really united. We're union. This is Ephesians 4, right? This is this union that, that we have with him. The one, 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 right? As you read those things. I mean, it all fits together when you put Paul together. So since Christ is our life, it makes perfect sense that the mooring place for our mental preoccupations should be and must be on spiritual realities in general and our Savior in particular. So it's on this basis that the passive sense of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, the allowance for the transformation by means of the Spirit and the subsequent metamorphosis he produces ensues. That is, the Spirit's operations engage Renewal of one's mental faculties, transition 
from the mundane or the things of this world to the super mundane or the things of God. So the renewed mind or mindset, Colossians 3, 2, is not content with mere contemplation, but is intent upon transformation, upon action, upon resolution. We want change. We want to see demonstrable change, not talk about it, not describe it, not define it. We want to see it. We want to exemplify it. We want to experience it. So what follows is Paul's disclosure, that's what follows deeper into Colossians 3, is Paul's disclosure of the spirit-enabled, spirit-powered believer living out the metamorphosis, the process of being transformed. For example, it's only when mental faculties are properly tuned and the mind or the mindset is surrendered to the influence of the spirit that one can lose the appetite for such things identified by Paul to be put to death. Look at verse five again. So put to death, since you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, align then your mental faculties with the re reality of your spiritual condition and live that out, right? So that results in a loss of appetite towards those fleshly things. So he says, put to death an aorist imperative. Why an aorist imperative? Again, because of the decisive resolve involved in that verb, put to death. So when faced with some moral choice, you resolve, you make a decisive, you know, you, you, take a dis, you take decisive action, put it to death. You repudiate such things. Uh, so correspondingly, if you look in, for example, Colossians 3, 10 to 12, then you clothe yourself with such things that adorn a properly attired Christ follower. And of course, this is all metaphorical kind of language. What does he say? Um, and have been close. See, in, in verses five and, and so on, you find all of the negative things that you would put to death, all those negative things. And then you find in verses 10 through 12, what? Other things. Oh, then you clothe the new man that is renewed in what? Knowledge according to the image um, image of the one. And, and here's another there's either Greek, no Jew, so on and so forth. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, clothe yourselves with a heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. It's, it's like the fruit of the Spirit all over again. And in the same Galatians 5 cataloging of what? Here are the works of the flesh. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. And you get that same kind of thing. So again, when the Spirit rules the mental faculties, when the spirit is forming us according to the spiritual realities of the new birth and our heavenly homeland, that's Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is where? He's just going to say it Colossians 3 differently, but in Philippians 3, he's going to say different motif, your citizenship is there. Here, he's going to say where Christ is seated, seated there, you know, our affections and appetites are consistent with this, you know, reflexive kind of put off, put on, put off spirit led resolutions. Where do we see it? Verses 9 through 17 here. Ephesians 4, 20 to 24 in the book of Ephesians, Galatians 5, 16 through 25. This is just basic Pauline stuff, you know, but, but since Paul, though writing situationally, to different pockets and groups of believers, he is saying the same thing. Virtually the same thing. What is he doing? He's saying, listen, how did Paul write about himself in Romans chapter seven 
And now he's just telling these other, look, look, he says, I've had to live out the same thing in my own life. He says, I am living out the same thing in my own life. And now he's telling them the same thing. It's not rocket science. Paul living as a believer is simply telling them, here's how to resolve your own issues, whether it's the church in Galatia, whether it's the church in Ephesus, whether it's the church in Colossae, whether it's the church in Philippi. He says, my life is but a template for how you're going to resolve these situations. It is the same Christian life lived out. So how, how do we get to this point? And we say, how do we get to this point beyond the physical weakness? As we said, we live life um, in this body, in this world, in this flesh, in this world, which means we contend uh, with on two fronts anyway, physical weakness moral embattlements and with the moral embattlements you could add to that the spiritual warfare and things of that nature so true believers are no longer in the flesh in the romans 8 9 sense of um fleshly that that, that you know the um uh, sin so lo no, no longer shall have lorded over you as six fourteen of romans says but but they battle the flesh in the sense of romans 725 this ever-present battle with sin that paul says so the believer possesses such a great resource and endowment in the person of the holy spirit yet many believers fail to cultivate this relationship or appropriate the fullness of the spirit's empowering and formative influences so it's when we remove when we remove it's inhibiting and free flowing nature. Um, so again, back to, um, we started in, in John chapter eight, back in, in John chapter seven. Um, so here's, here's a premise for you. John chapter seven, 37 and 39, the last day of the feast, the greatest day, Jesus stood up and shouted out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. And just as the scripture says, from within him will flow rivers of living water. Now, he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were going to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the premise is that we can either encourage or inhibit this free-flowing work of the Spirit in our lives. And so if, if, we are just going to sort of take the helm of our lives and, and we're going to govern and rule our minds and simply um, not, not yield control of our minds to the spirit. And um, s simply retain control of that ourselves. I, I know this is a, um, it's a difficult thing to wrap your head around. Uh, again, there's another pun. But <laughs> uh, if you're going to do that, then you're going to say, okay, great, I found another terrific principle in the Bible, and I'm going to do it. You know, it's sort of like I found it, and I will do it. Well, then what do you need the Holy Spirit for? You know, if, if that's the case. I just think about that. So how, how involved is the Holy Spirit in this whole process of your becoming Christ-like, in the whole process of you growing in the Christian life? If it's just, I'm reading the Bible, and um, you I, sincerely, I, I, I believe you sincerely, dear Christian, uh, believe that the Spirit of God is giving you wisdom and insight to understand. Of course, of course, that's how we understand this. Uh, and yet the uh, application uh, of it, the appropriation, the implementation of the plan, if it's not done by the Spirit's empowerment, it's going to fail, miserably fail. I think you can do a certain amount on your own, Really, but I think ultimately it's just going to fail. And I don't know that maybe a lot of Christians have never really seen 
the work of the Spirit of God in their life. Maybe they've only ever seen what they can do themselves. Maybe. See if you follow what I'm saying and track with it. I'm sure you are because maybe, maybe you are because you're really brilliant people. Uh, I mean that sincerely. I don't say things facetiously, intentionally anyway. So you take the word of God. We are believers. We have the spirit of God in our life. And we know we can't understand scripture, but for the spirit of God and the spirit of God illumines truth to us. And we have all that. And that's great. And that's wonderful. So we're reading this. And as much as we can, comparing scripture with scripture, we interpret it, we understand it. And then we say, okay, Lord, please help me apply it. And we, 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 we try to apply it. But if it is not the, by the Spirit's power, who is the true transforming agent, if he does not take full control, then, then the whole plan fails at implementation. It just becomes what I can build with my crazy tools and my inferior whatever, and it just collapses. And if you ever wonder why, why, why does everything always systemically break down at the same point? Why do I never seem to conquer this in my life? Why, why, why do I seem to just keep stumbling and stumbling and stumbling? It's because... Maybe, maybe you have enough light to discover what the problem is, but you're not permitting yourself to yield control to the only one who can fix the problem. And I can't answer that. I, I can't answer why. Why you won't yield control? Why you won't yield control? I don't know, is it fear? Is it, what, what is it that you just won't yield control? Now, it's a, it is a unnerving thing to yield over control because the Spirit of God will break down all your defenses. He will take you in a direction you don't want to go. He will make you the most vulnerable and he will change, he will change, he will change, he will change, he will change your personality. He will. You will not be the same. You won't. When Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now you just soak in that whole deny yourself. Take that one on for a project. It does not mean deny to yourself something. This isn't Lent. Deny yourself. Jesus is saying, you become me. You become me. Do you know what it is to have the self? We've been talking about, we have these bodies. The bodies are controlled by the brain. What tells the brain what to do with the mind? What tells the mind what to think? That mysterious self, that mysterious whatever, that nobody knows, right? And we're saying, let the spirit have access. Let the spirit take control. Um, so when that happens, you know, if we're going to be Christ-like, how can it be me saying, it'll be me, I'll just be me trying to copy who Jesus is in my life? Does that make any sense to anybody? That makes no sense. Jesus says, listen, I come in, I take over. I just come in and take over. Well, we know what demon possession looks like, right? It's hideous. Well, what is spirit possession? It's beautiful. As he comes in, he takes over. So there's this sense that we inhibit everything and we say things like, you just need to get out of the way. 
you know, let go, let God, you know, we say all this stuff, but we don't mean it. We don't mean it because we really don't want to let go. Because if we let go, then we change. But when we do, when we do, this is when the Spirit of God, we take the lid off, right? See, we suppress stuff. Like, it's like this. It's not, it's, it's completely, I'm telling you, it's 180 degrees from what you think. We think being filled with the Spirit means we go to a gas pump or something or a water tank and we just say, yep, got to get more of that and, f and fill it. Got to gotta fill it. Got to fill it. Listen, you have all the Spirit you're ever going to get. I'm telling you. It isn't about that. He just doesn't have all of you. There's too much of us. And when you, it's all just being suppressed by us. And the minute we go away, it just backfills. It just poosh, like this. So you get in a situation, just from a practical standpoint, you get in a situation and God says, listen, this is my will in this situation. This is my will, my way in this, I'm talking just situationally. This particular situation, practical outcome. God, I need you in this. I need you in that. And whether it's a ministry thing, whether it's a family thing, whatever it is, I need you in that. Whether it's provision, protection, whatever, you seek him, this is what it is. This is what it is. You get you out of the way, it just backfills. Now it's the spirit takes full control of that whole thing. You watch God go to work, period. It doesn't take us off the, off the, off the hook for all things. But it's him taking control of our lives and doing what we could never do through us. And you watch and see what God does. Is this any different than Moses sticking that staff out? You just watch and see what God does. But without that, Moses can stand there all day long. All day long. This is how God works. Okay, so we'll um, we'll come back uh, next next week and talk a little bit more. Yeah, so talk more about filling, what that is, and I'm going to use Jesus as an example, as an archetype of this, um, and show exactly pattern from him. Carry that over to the early church. See how. See how that happened, just so we can get an understanding of, of what that looks like, a little bit clearer understanding of it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, your patience with us as we try to draw out what was an obvious, so obvious and simple a truth to uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, but we, we're so thankful that he repeated it so, so many places that we can uh, tie it all together. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, encourage us to uh, take something uh, home with us and, and for those that uh, just patiently listen in different continents uh, uh, and, and view this in different continents over the time zones uh, today and, and, and during the week, we're thankful for them and uh, certainly pray for them and what, and what they're uh, going through and, and how they're serving you in, the, in these uh, places around the world. Um, Lord, we want to be faithful to you. We want to serve you, but we want to serve you in your, in your power uh, and uh, we want to see the fruit of that uh, in our lives. We want to be, be more uh, like Jesus in our, our thoughts, our words, our, our actions, because we know a world is, is looking for that, looking for not just better news, but the best news. Uh, and that comes through faith in your son. Help us be living examples of that, the living in embodiment of that. Um, so thank you, Lord, for what you've done today and what you'll continue to do in and through us throughout this day and throughout the week to come till we uh, meet each other once again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.